The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. It took an uprising of people throughout San Mateo County to say no to the road that would bypass the treacherous and unstable Devil Slide and to push for a tunnel instead. 17 years later, the tunnel has opened, and we talked to two of the key leaders who roused rabble and got all of us to think tunnel. The game is politics. The game is on. I'm Nicholas Calderon. And I'm Mark Simon. When the California Department of Transportation decided to build a roadway bypassing Devil's Slide, they thought it would be faster and cheaper than building a tunnel. Building a safe passage up the coast side would override any objection anyone might have to the fact that the roadway went through environmentally sensitive lands. But a small group of activists said the cheap alternative exacted too high a price to the long treasured land and county preserves the road would run through. And a couple of those activists are among the roll call of people some call heroes for stopping the roadway and winning the battle for a tunnel. So at this point, I want us to put our hands together and recognize four women who literally made history by getting this tunnel on the ballot into the national budget and into this mountain. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Lenny Roberts. <laughs> Zoe Kirsten Tucker. April Vargas, and Senator Barbara Boxer. Yeah. Lenny Roberts and Zoe Kirstein Tucker, two of the leaders of the uh, effort to get us to think tunnel, build tunnel, and finally open tunnel. I, I skipped the vote tunnel part. The Tom Lantos tunnels at Devil's Slide. Both of you, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, Start with, tell us, Lenny, why we had to have a tunnel. Why not a bypass road? And why did we need to do something at Devil's Slide? Well, first of all, the tunnel had been planned by freeway builders in the 50s and 60s. And it was the part of a major freeway system that Caltrans wanted to build down the coast that would have made Highway 1 into a six-lane freeway from San Francisco to San Luis Obispo. So it was... Um, as, as time went on, uh, people realized that this was not going to be the right thing for the coast. We, we needed to preserve the coast, protect it from sprawling development, which the original bypass was designed to serve. So in the early 70s, people decided to start taking action to stop Caltrans from building it. On the other hand, Zoe, there were some practical reasons. I mean, Highway 1, as it was constructed, was not a workable solution. It had to change, didn't it? Absolutely. Ever since the Ocean Shore Railroad, which was ran along that same area, kept washing out, they built a highway in there, and about every 10 years, the road would, would fail, and people on the coast side would be stranded. Um, the businesses would suffer. The commuters, people who had to work over the hill, would suffer. They'd sit in their cars for hours and hours. So clearly, something had to be done. Um, the road had to be repaired permanently. And we knew we just didn't want the Caltrans alternative, that big freeway up and over the mountain. Well, what was wrong with the bypass solution as Caltrans saw it? It was a, and let's describe it a little bit. It would, it would basically circumvent Montana Mountain. It would go inland, um, which seemed like, at least from an engineering point of view, a logical solution. If a road on the, the edge of the, the, the continent keeps washing out, let's go in a real distance, some distance we know won't won't be washed out, and build a real road. Well, the geography was the problem. Uh, it required a very steep grade to go up and over the saddle between Montero Mountain and Pedro Point, and um, it, it required huge cuts and fills for, originally it was going to be a seven mile long bypass of a 600 foot long problem. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it cuts across, it would have cut across prime agricultural lands up and over Montero Mountain through a state park. These are scenic resources, scenic coastal resources that I think everybody on the coast or many people on the coast felt really needed to be preserved. And if there was an alternative that would allow us to preserve those scenic resources, um, then we really needed to find it. Yeah, but you're stuck in a situation where you need a road and you need it right away. You don't need it. It took a long time to build these tunnels. Um, what was so objectionable? I mean, it, there's a practicality, Caltrans would argue, to doing what they wanted to do. Well, the challenge here was that, as Lenny referred to earlier, the freeway bypass was built in the 50s really to um, provide access to what was conceived as a huge set of sprawling subdiv subdivisions on the coast side. I think the original plans were for something like 200,000 people living in this very rural area. And over time, you know, those <clears throat> plans changed, you know, the, the growth pattern changed on the coast, and we no longer, no longer needed this gigantic freeway. We didn't have those same development plans. So having something that was scaled more appropriately to the development, um, I don't know, the development picture on the coast was, was more appropriate. So, so if I may, um, you know, the tunnel, uh, we're going to jump forward a little bit. How do you picture the tunnel changing the shape of, of the coast side? You know, not just the mid coast, but Half Moon Bay as well, um, providing a, a, a stable way of, of getting in and out. What's the future of, of the coast side look like? Well, I think the best part about the tunnel is it's going to be a reliable transportation facility so that people won't be stalled every time there's a huge winter and the road slides mm -hmm. or rocks come down from above on, and stop traffic. Right. So it will provide um, a, a, you know, a reliable source of transportation not only for residents to go to their jobs but also for um, visitors to come down the coast and the businesses in both Pacifica and Half Moon Bay largely depend upon those visitors. So I think it'll be a boon to the coast side generally. Yeah, well, yeah, but let's talk about the, the law of unintended consequences, which always kicks in. Before we went on the air, we were talking about some of the frustration people who live on the coast side have about traffic on the weekends. Isn't this making it easier? Now there's another reason for people to go to the coast side. This is an attraction, and it's making, even, be, even before the tunnels when Devil's Slide was not washed out, it was not an easy road to drive. There was a couple of stretches of downhill and some turns that probably made people uncomfortable. You've made it easier for people to get to the coast side. Is that a good thing? Well, but remember, the capacity of this road hasn't changed. It's still two lanes. It is a little bit easier, but the way I look at it is, you know, the coastal resources that we have, the scenic open spaces, the beaches, all those things, they should be used by people. I mean, they belong to the people of this country. They're, they're national resources. We've got a national park in our backyard now. So I think it's appropriate to have people come to the coast and visit these resources. And we will certainly have to deal, I think, eventually with the traffic. But I think that's appropriate. We're going to take a quick break and come back and talk some more with Lenny Roberts and Zoe Kirstein Tucker about the Tom Lantos tunnels at Devil's Slide. Stay with us. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Nicholas Calderon. And over here, we have Lenny Roberts, political uh, legislative advocate for the Committee for Green Foothills, and Zoe Kirstein Tucker, who was the spokeswoman for the Build the Tunnel campaign, and was because they built the tunnels. They're open. They're ready to be used. Uh, we have a clip here from Anna Eshoo, who I think pretty well captures the, the next major phase of the debate which is the, the efforts of Caltrans to do something other than what you wanted them to do. And if we can roll that clip, Rocky. And I want to thank Caltrans 
for getting the message then. I remember, <laughs> I remember when I first went to the Board of Supervisors, uh, John Ward, Supervisor John Ward, said we need to go to Sacramento to meet with Caltrans. And it was uh, Birch Bachtold that I met with, and he set it down and said in no uncertain language, that road is going to be built. Well, not so much, huh? <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the fight with Caltrans and, and how, how big a fight was it? They, were they simply refused to acknowledge that there was another way to do this? Uh, it started with lawsuits, I guess. You had to stop right. them from doing what they wanted to do, Lenny. Yes, in 1972, uh, the Committee for Green Foothills, Sierra Club, uh, several other organizations and individuals went to court to stop Caltrans, which, and they were Caltrans was just about to start <coughs> building the bypass. They they had their plans and specifications and estimates ready to go out to bid. So we successfully stopped them because they had not prepared an environmental impact report. So um, at that point, Caltrans just decided to uh, not pursue anything and wait for an emergency, and hopefully they could just not even do that. So they were kind of, that was their strategy, was to just wait until there was an emergency. Everybody would be so upset with the road closure that they'd just overru overrule everybody and go ahead. So um, we, we had to both come up with a, with an alternative solution that was kind of the challenge for the opponents and also we had to hold them off uh, through subsequent lawsuits after they were proposing other projects like a, a disposing of the um, cliff they would build a, a, a little a road more inland but along where the slide was and push all that material over the cliff which turned out not to be feasible because of the marine sanctuary. So um, it was a real challenge for the opponents to keep stopping Caltrans at every step of the way until 1996 when we decided we were going to have to do an initiative measure that required Caltrans to build a tunnel. But, but how sure were you that the initiative would even work? I mean. It they're not bound by a San Mateo County ordinance necessarily, are they? Well, at that point, we knew we had run out of really, we'd run out of choices. You know, we were kind of at our at, at the end of the legal battles. We were at the end of the scientific battles. We knew we had to take it to the, to the people, and it was our only option. So we figured we'd better try it. And what Measure T did is changed our local coastal program to mandate construction of a tunnel at Devil Slide. It replaced the freeway bypass with the tunnel. So um, at first, we weren't all that confident. I mean, we just figured we'd better give it, a, give it a whirl because we didn't have any other choices. And we started talking to people. And the more we talked to people and the more we showed them pictures and models and some of our graphics, the more we realized people were really into this idea. They liked it. And they really, really wanted more information from Caltrans. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the start in 1995 and 96. So, um what did it feel like? Were you, were you at any point along the way convinced you were going to win, or did you just think, you're, you know, you're David going against Goliath, this isn't going to work out? During the tunnel campaign? Or even, during, even before then. I mean, there uh, must have been a point at which you thought more than once, I, I don't think we're going to win this. Caltrans is too powerful. They've got too much influence. They're them. We are us. They, uh, they, they get to do what they want to do. Was there a point at which that, that happened, or were you thinking, they don't know who they're dealing with. <laughs> no, I mean, we just knew we were right. We, were, we, we knew we were right, and we knew we, ha we, we were, were taxpayers, so why wouldn't they answer our questions about this? There was kind of this righteous indignation that just you know, really spread throughout the county as people were, were so frustrated that we weren't, that our State Department of Transportation wasn't answering some fundamental questions for us. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we were ever going to give up. Yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> Let's talk about the local uh, political status quo that you were bucking. You, you couldn't get the Board of Supervisors to sign on to the plan. Why not? That's right. Well, it's just like lots of things that have been planned for a very long time. They have, they take on a life of their own. It, it, you can't even try to change the course of the ship a few degrees and make it go in a different direction. So um, we had two members of the Board of Supervisors who supported studying a tunnel, and that was Ruben Barales and Ted Lempert. But the other three members um, 
just felt that that was kind of a waste of time. We're on this track to build the bypass. Yeah. It, it must have been frustrating. I mean, like, uh, Lenny, I know you. you, you, you're not afraid to call up a member of the Board of Supervisors and tell them what you think they ought to do. Uh, it, it, it must have been frustrating that you couldn't yeah, budge them. It was. it was hugely frustrating, but actually I think it was one of the most helpful things for us because it people who were just maybe um, casual bystanders, the more we started talking to them about, about this in the community, the more people signed on and wanted to be part of this, this tunnel movement. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of helpful actually to have you know, such a, a strong opposition from the Board of Supervisors. Once the measure got on the ballot, their opposition what did they go? Ran, ran silent and ran deep? I mean, what happened? Bef just by the time the election occurred, we had the support of the, all the members of the Board of Supervisors, as well as every newspaper and uh, <clears throat> other politicos as well. So we were pretty sure it was going to pass, even, even though there was some opposition. Actually, at that point, even our the funded opposition, the no on Measure T campaign, had dropped away by yeah. that point too. We were such a force in the community. So, so 90, 1996, uh, Measure T passes. Mm -hmm. Then you have to wait until 2013 for this tunnel to open. What is that? What is that like? <laughs> I mean, how, how frustrating is that? You know, as, as you go along, you, uh, the nice thing that happened right after Measure T passed was that. Um, Supervisor Ted Lempert and then Rich Gordon and then Don Horsley, the successors to Ted, um, had a task force at work that brought in all the different parties, including Caltrans, the Federal Highways, the, our Senate, our state Senate, our all the agencies, all the agencies um, and the citizens were also at the table. So we well, let me met. stop you there. We're going to yeah. come back to that thought. Hold right. that thought. We'll be right back. Stick around. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Nicholas Calderon. Over here we have Lenny Roberts and Zoe Kirstein Tunk uh, Tucker, two of the leading tunnelistas, the leaders of the campaign <laughs> that ultimately resulted in the Tom Lantos tunnels at Devil's Slide. Nicholas, you were asking about, okay, 1996, you win. Uh, you don't get to declare victory, though. What, uh, we're talking about what took so long, because um, it took a heck of a long time. It did take a long time, and it, w it took a frustratingly long time. But it's, it's important to remember that all Measure T did was mandate construction of the tunnel um, as the permanent repair of Devil's Light. It had no money associated with it. Mm -hmm. It had no environmental clearances associated with it. So that was the first thing we had to do after um, uh, Supervisor Rich Gordon convened this task force was to get to work on getting the money. Mm -hmm. So we had to work with Congressman Tom Lantos and Senator Barbara Boxer. And then there was a the long slog of really working through some of the environmental issues. And most the design. And the design. Um, so at every step of the way, it took a little bit longer than we had anticipated. But At some it's point done. or another, did Caltrans <laughs> become a real partner in this effort? Or was there, I mean, once the ballot measure was done and there was money, were they signed on? Or even in the design of it, were there things you had to fight with them over? No, it was a, it was a marvelous change of... of um, of direction for Caltrans. Mm -hmm. They became partners in ensuring that the tunnel would be built. Yeah. Virtually the next day after yeah. the election, yeah. they, they completely they got it. turned around. And <laughs> Good for them. Uh, that must yeah. have been nice. Yeah. 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 We have another clip here. Uh, I have to warn you, it's uh, Supervisor Don Horsley, who happens to be Nicholas's uh, boss <laughs> in the interest of full disclosure. But uh, he was there the day of. He represents the coast side and has some interesting perspective on uh, what the tunnel means now. You know, and I have to give Caltrans a lot of credit, probably also the residents on the coast side that really pushed for this tunnel, that it's not just a tunnel, it really is a work of art. Is it? I mean, do you, do you look at it with a, a level of pride you maybe didn't anticipate? 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful thing. The portals on both sides are so fitting with the local, you know, geology and environment. It's just, it's really beautiful. It makes me feel really proud every time I, every time I drive through and see it. I think the other thing that's wonderful about it, it it's truly a state-of-the-art tunnel. Yeah. Uh, it has all the, you know, emergency provisions, uh, all the uh, sensors and so forth that, that can, um, you know, take care of any problems that might be occurring in the tunnel. So. No Wi-Fi, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <That's true. laughs> There's always something, isn't there? Uh, let me ask you something. This was a real grassroots uprising, I mean, a huge grassroots organizational effort. And the question is, is that left behind? I mean, many times when there's a political movement of the kind this was, there's something left in place that changes the political dynamic well beyond the project that got people going. Has that been the case here, or was this a one-off? And we got the tunnel, we got the, the ballot measure approved, and everybody sort of went back to their business. No, I mean, there's such a group of empowered citizens as a result of the passage of Measure T. Many of us went on to fight a number of other battles which have been important along the way um, to extend the Mid-Peninsula Regional open, sta mm -hmm. open Space District boundaries to the coast, Quarry Park, so many other efforts that, you know, have been energized by the Measure T effort, not to mention the Committee for Green Foothills, which continues on, you know, its wonderful work in the on the peninsula and on the coast side, so. So, so the, the tunnels are open. Everyone's happy about it. You said you've gotten to drive through it, you know, almost every day. Um, after the tunnels are now, now that they're open, there are two things that are left remaining, which is the old road mm -hmm. and then the, the proposed route for the bypass. Mm -hmm. What do you guys see as um, the future for those? Well, the the old road is is going to become a, a, a trail for yeah. pedestrians and hikers and bicyclists. So that will not open for about another year, but San Mateo County is going to be working on making sure that trail is a wonderful experience and Caltrans is gonna be building the um, parking areas and staging areas mm -hmm. at both ends. Then the old bypass route, um, mm -hmm. part of it will become part of McNee Ranch State Park. Mm -hmm. And then the part that's to the south uh, still has to be planned and, um, uh, and, and the planning idea is that it will be, become a linear park and a trail Caltrans owns that property and they will have to decide at some point to transfer it to another agency to manage it as that park and trail. And Nicholas, you ask about, your, I think you were asking about continuing efforts after Measure T. Actually right now the Pacifica Beach Coalition is starting a whole cleanup effort on the old road. So they're going to start pulling out invasives, you know, the invasives and things mm -hmm. to get ready for that to become one of the most beautiful walks on earth. Oh, it's going to be absolutely amazing. Yeah. We have another clip. Uh, we want to show one more clip from the, the, the tunnel event uh, that Rocky Robinson was out there braving the cold with, uh, with his camera. Rocky, would you roll that clip please? However, there would have been no tunnel project if it hadn't been for the effort of the people who knew the right thing to do and who fought so hard for it. So in my mind, in Lenny Roberts' mind, in the mind of tunnelistas everywhere, this is and will always be the people's tunnel. Yeah. How does it feel? I mean, we, we, Lenny and I were talking uh, before the show so many things that people work on of this nature are never quite finished. I mean, we talked in Nicholas's question about things that still need to be done, but uh, it's rare to, to start something, start a fight, and have it result in something tangible. How does it feel? I mean, you've been in a lot of battles over the years. <laughs> yeah. And this one is, I've been involved in this one since 1972. So it, it's, it is incredibly satisfying to see a, you know, we have a, a final product uh, that was a positive outcome that everyone can take a great deal of pride in, especially the people of San Mateo County who voted for it. 151,000 people voted yes on the tunnel measure. That's an incredible landslide vote. So, you know, this is the this is the uh, this is the the um, the fitting, very fitting outcome for that effort over such a long period of time. Zoe, it was clearly an emotional moment for you. It was. Was that a surprise to you that it was going to hit you that way? It it was a surprise. I I couldn't help it. It was just such an emotional day for me to look out at the sea of people and, you know, waving their flags and and just remembering how many people 
over the space of decades came together to make this whole thing happen. And it was such a, you know, to use such a hackneyed term, a win-win. But it, it absolutely is. We have protected this beautiful mountain and all those scenic and uh, scenic resources, and we have a state-of-the-art tunnel. So it's, it's kind of perfect all the way around. <laughs> and it feels? <laughs> it feels beyond satisfying. It just makes me feel incredibly proud to have been part of this effort, to have worked with so many dedicated and passionate citizens, and it's, it's very, very, very satisfying. Well, congratulations to both of you. Uh, I, I'm sure you will enjoy driving through the tunnels uh, on many, many occasions. Thank you for being with us. Lenny Roberts, legislative advocate for the Committee for Green Foothills, and Zoe Kirstein Tucker, who was the spokesperson for the Yes on Tea campaign, among other things. Uh, both of them considered uh, key people in how this thing turned out. I'm Mark Simon. He's Nicholas Calderon, and that's been The Game. Thanks for joining us, and be with us next time.